All right, so welcome to lecture 15 on Euler's function and the structure of UN. Uh, let me give you a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about. So the group of units in UN has a special structure. I'll explain how to express UN as a product of cyclic groups up to isomorphism. This will allow us to find the group exponent, which is important for our future study of RSA encryption. And also, when UN is cyclic, we'll examine how that allows us to solve certain nonlinear congruences via substitution. And we'll also find additional formulas to aid in the calculation of the Euler function. All right, so let's get to it. First of all, um, we'll review a little bit about isomorphism. So, um, so we need a little bit. We need, there's some group theory we need uh, for our discussion here, and I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time proving group theoretic things. I'll, I'll pretty much just remind you um, of the definition and maybe do a little bit of proving, but there's some, there'll be some gaps in this lecture, okay? So, um, in terms of like details about group theory, but um, hopefully I'll <clears throat> tell you enough that you can make sense of it here. So first of all, two groups are isomorphic if <clears throat> there's a bijection from one group to the other and that bijection preserves the group operation. So I'm supposing G has the star operation and H, ha I mean asterisk, and H has the star, so the asterisk turns to star. So like one might be additive, one might be multiplicative, so like plus would change to multiply or vice versa. Here's an example. So we can look at G as the uh, modular integers and H as a particular set of complex numbers. So um, this omega is called the primitive, or I forget, primitive or principal n through to unity. Um, and um, if you look at it, when you raise it to the nth power, it goes back to one again. So this h is the set of one omega omega squared to that omega to the n minus one, where omega is this particular complex number right there. Now, the isomorphism from g to h is relatively simple. What you do is just say psi of the uh, modular, um, the psi of the congruence class with representative j, we just map that to omega to the power j. Now, whenever you make a definition like this, it begs a question, is that is that well-defined? Because if I used a different representative for the equivalence class represented by j, would I get a different answer? Well, well, I don't. See, because if I had this equal to j equal to j prime like that, that means j prime is j plus a multiple of n. But then, when I calculate omega to the j prime, I get omega to the j plus nk. And that is omega to the j times omega n to the k, but remember omega to the n is just one. So there you have it. Um, we have that omega j prime is omega j, which means it doesn't matter what we choose for our representative, we get the same answer, so the map is well defined. And um, it's also easy to see that this map has an inverse because you can write the inverse down with this formula right here, and you can check that it's an inverse. Um, so if, it's a, if it has an inverse, then it's pretty clearly injective and surjective, and uh, indeed it's a bijection. So that is to say that this psi is an isomorphism of the modular, um, modular integers, modulo n, and the group of um, nth roots of unity, as it's called. H is the nth group of nth roots of unity. Um, and it's in it, indeed, it's also operation preserving. I guess I need to prove that, right? So here it is. Plus in the and Zn changes to plus in the exponent of the omega, which then becomes multiplication of the omegas, which becomes multiplication of psi of j and psi of k. So addition tra uh, tra transfers to multiplication under this isomorphism. So just to be explicit, <clears throat> um, to be explicit here, the um, if we look at Z, Z mod 4, and if we look at the fourth roots of unity, well, the fourth roots of unity are explicitly, um, because e to the pi i over 2 is actually i, um, the fourth roots of unity are 1 i i squared i cubed, which is to say 1 i minus 1 minus i. And this set of complex numbers under multiplication is isomorphic to this set of modular numbers under um, modular arithmetic mod 4. So I should mention that omega, we usually, sometimes people put like a sub n on it, and then other people still will use a zeta n for e to the 2 pi i over n, which again is this, and that's the 
the principle nth root of unity. So I think we'll, we'll circle back to that in a later lecture when I talk more about complex arithmetic because and I think all teachers need to know more about complex arithmetic. Certainly we're not teaching enough of it in schools these days. Um, I know, I know. We're having enough trouble with the regular arithmetic. Why you got to make it complex arithmetic, right? But anyway, so um, so the group G of order n is said to be cyclic, or some people say cyclic, but they're wrong. Um, cyclic with, <laughs> just, just joking, cyclic with generator G if G is equal to E G G squared da 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 G n minus 1. And we'll write G is generated by G in this case. For an additive group, the um, generated by G, it's, it's multiples like uh, G, G plus G, G plus G plus G, all the way out to N minus, G added to itself N minus one full times. All right, here E is the multiplicative identity. Sometimes we call that one. Um, in the additive case, E is zero. All right, so here's some examples. ZN, well, that's cyclic because if you take one and just add it to itself repeatedly, you get all of Zn. So Zn is cyclic. Um, here's another example, U10, which has got a 1, a 3, a 7, and a 9, mod 10. Well, if you look at 3 squared, you get 9. Um, 3 squared is 27, but mod 10, that's 7. 3 to the fourth is 81, but mod 10, that's 1. So this shows you that powers of 3 give you everything in here, right? And also powers of 7 give you uh, 7 squared is 49, which is congruent to 9 mod 10. And then 7 cubed is 9 times 7, which is 63, which is 3. And then 7 to the 4th is, is 1 mod 10 again. So either 3 or 7 serve as generators. So we have u10 is generated by 3. It's also generated by 7. Thus u10 is cyclic with generators 3 and 7. Um, Notice that we can't use 9 as a generator because 9 just generates 1 and 9 because 9 squared is back to 1 again. So 9 is an element of order 2, as it's, as it's called, whereas 3 and 7 are elements of order 4. If you have a group of order 4, you need an element of order 4 in order to generate it. All right. And if it's not possible to generate the group by an element of order, whatever the order of the group is, then the group is not cyclic. Okay. Uh, so here's a theorem. A theorem. If G and H are cyclic groups of order N, then G is isomorphic to H. Okay, so any two cyclic groups of the same order are isomorphic. In, so, in other words, they're essentially the same group with just different notation being used as a way to think about that. So if G is generated by X and H is generated by Y, and they both have the same order, then we can just say psi of x to the m equals y to the m, and you can prove that that mapping defines an isomorphism from g to h. All right, I won't do all the details, but that is the isomorphism. Okay, um, z4 and u10 are both cyclic groups of order 4, thus u10 is isomorphic to z4. Essentially, these are the same group with a different notation being used for their operation. It's, a, it's an intuition for that. All right. So isomorphism is important. Isomorphism is important because like um, many properties of groups are preserved under isomorphism, like um, an invertible element maps to an invertible element. Um, the order of an element is preserved under an isomorphism, right? So, um, you know, we, we saw that u10 had an element of order, two elements of order 4 and one element of order 2 and the identity. That means that z4 also has two elements of order 4, one element of order 2, and the identity, all right, um, because these are isomorphic. Um, let's go on here. So the other thing that we need to be a little bit conversant in in order to understand some of the number theoretic results here, to appreciate them, um, <clears throat> is the direct product of groups. So if we have um, G1 through GK are groups, all right, and um, and um, the, the, well, the direct product then is the Cartesian product of all of them as sets, and you define the multiplication of the product to be, um, is component-wise defined, so you just multiply the first ones according to the rule in G1, you multiply the second ones according to the rule in G2, 
and so forth in, in term and so forth and so on and, and until you get to the multiplication in GK. Um, or if it was if there were, if you were using additive groups, you would add component wise, right? Um, now, if I wanted to say glutton for punishment, I would have used a different symbol for the multiplication on each one of these, right? Because you could have like a mixed situation where like G1 is multiplicative and G2 is um, additive, and then you'd have multiplication in the first spot but addition in the second spot. There's all kinds of you know weirder notations you could think about, but th this pretty much covers our what we're interested in because we're pretty much either looking at products of multiplicative groups or products of additive groups. All right, so like here's a product of additive groups. Z2 and Z3 are groups under um, addition. Uh, I'm borrowing my wife's phone, apparently she's got an email. Hmm, I might be in trouble. Uh, let's see here. So Z3, Z2 cross Z3 is is all this, but my my son stole my phone to play a game. So I'm, anyway, hmm. all right. Um, so yeah, I might have to give that phone up here. Mm -hmm. Rats. Right, let's continue. Um, so Z2 cross Z3, it's got these six elements, okay? And it's easy enough to see that if you look at multiples of 1, 1, and you just, you know, add it to itself repeatedly, so here's 0 times 1, 1, that's always in there. Okay, I just got it out of the way before I forget about it. You get 1, 1, and then 1, 1 plus 1, 1, and then 1, 1 added to itself three full times, four full times, five full times. You work out the rules mod 2 and mod 3 in the first and second um, components, respectively, and you get this set of tuples, which is exactly all that there is. So that shows you that Z2 cross Z3 is, in fact, a cyclic group of order 6, right? So if it's a cyclic group of order 6, therefore Z2 cross Z3, using the previous theorem, it's isomorphic to Z6 as it happens, right? Okay. Oh, well here's the theorem. If the um, R, if the moduli are coprime, then ZR cross ZS is isomorphic to ZRS. All right. And um, here's the proof down here. And um, part of the reason we covered uh, the Chinese remainder theorem, besides that it's just helpful for understanding how to solve systems of congruences, is because it's also necessary to understand this isomorphism. So we'd send psi of the RS, X, RS um, congruence class to the pair of X sub R and X sub S congruence classes. So we do mod R for this one, we do mod S for that one. I show it's well defined. All right, great. And then um, I say, okay, so to show it's surjective, if we pick an arbitrary A and B in respectively ZR and ZS, right, that's an arbitrary thing in ZR cross ZS, we want to find an X in the RS congruence, um, instead of the RS congruences, which maps to this pair, right, under the isomorphism. Well, what that means is we need to solve x congruent to a mod r and x congruent to b mod s simultaneously. Hey, a simultaneous set of linear congruence with coprime moduli. That is what the Chinese remainder theorem is all about. The Chinese remainder theorem gives us a unique solution to that, modulo rs. So there you have it. That proves that the, the isomorphism is onto. But notice that that's enough to show that it's a bijection because we're dealing in the context that this is a set with RS elements and that's a set with RS elements. So if you have a finite mapping, a mapping on a finite set with RS things to another finite set with RS things, if the mapping is surjective, it's automatically injective and so it's a bijection. And then finally you can see that it's operation preserving. So there you go. We have this isomorphism. So and that isomorphism is also kind of the same one that you can use. It's not quite, well, yeah, it's the same map, but different interpretation. That same formula essentially allows us to prove that if we have coprime moduli, then U R Cartesian product with U S, the group of units mod R across the group of units mod S is isomorphic to the group of units mod R S. Again, it's important that R S and B coprime, R and S be coprime. If they're not, this is not true. Um, so again, same map. We already proved it's well-defined. 
and to see it's N2, see I need to check that this is N2. How do I know that that being relatively prime to RS gives me that it's relatively prime to both R and S separately? Well, it's pretty obvious actually from Bazoo. If I have AX plus BRS equal to 1, then you can look at this in terms of, um, you know, you just basically factor out the um, S or factor out the R, and you see that you've also got a bazoo, a bazoo combination equal to 1 um, to give you that, you know, the GCD of um, X with R and X with S is also equal to 1, which is to say that the inverse exists um, for X with respect to the S moduli and the R moduli. And so, hooray, that means this mapping is into there, which is what we want. And we can also check operation preserving. This time we're preserving multiplication. Like last page, you're preserving addition, right? Um, and so it's pretty much a natural calculation. This times this is that, which maps to this. But then by definition, this is the product of that and that, and this is the product of that and that. But then by the definition of the product group, that's this tuple times that tuple, which then going back to the definition of the isomorphism is psi of XRS and psi of YRS, which shows you that multiplication is preserved under this mapping. It remains to prove, of course, that the mapping is a bijection, that is that it's one to one and on to. And the proof I give down here, let me scoot it up a bit. I don't think it's immediately obvious that the same number of unit that, that URS and UR cross US have the same number of elements, so here I have to give separate proofs of injective and onto, okay? Um, so I do that here. To prove injective, I suppose that the outputs are equal. That gives me this is equal to that, which gives me both this and that. But that says x is congruent to y mod r and x is congruent to y mod s, which, you know, and then I decided, to, I mean, I think if I quoted the appropriate theorem, that would be enough to say, oh, so x is congruent to y mod r s. But I just work through the details here just to be safe. So I got like y minus x is equal to r is a multiple of j, uh, multiple of r, and y minus x is a multiple of s. Um, but j, r, and s are um, co-prime. So what that means is that if we have rj equal to rs, since r and s are co-prime, it must be that r divides, since r can't divide s, it has to divide k since it's you know the co-prime. So since r divides k, that means that um, k is a multiple of r, and then if you plug that back in, you get y minus x is equal to srl, which is to say that x is congruent to y mod rs, which is to say that when the outputs are equal, the inputs are equal. So psi is injective, it's one to one. And then, to prove it's onto, it's again the Chinese remainder theorem. Ooh, uh-oh, this could be controversial. Look what I've done. Um, Chinese remainder theorem, don't worry. Uh, let's see here, so if we have anything in the Cartesian product of the, the unit groups, then by uh, the Chinese remainder theorem, x congruent to a and x is congruent to b mod r and mod s respectively, so there's a unique solution, um, x not rs, according to the Chinese remainder theorem, which maps to this, which is that. So there you go, it's on to. So it's a bijection, it preserves operation, it's an isomorphism. Hooray! So we have this wonderful result. Now once you know that, we're off to the races, because then we can count. We can count groups of units. We can count things in the group of units, right? In particular, we have this theorem, which is essentially a corollary to the one I just proved, which is that if R and S are co-prime, then phi of R S is equal to phi of R times phi of S. So this is sometimes called the multiplicative property of the Euler phi function. That is very, very nice. Um, the proof is very simple. Since the R and S co-prime implies that U R S is isomorphic to U R cross U S, that tells you that the size of that group must be the same as the size of that group because bijections preserve the number of elements of finite groups. And so the order of this is equal to order of that times order of that, right? Because the order of a Cartesian product of finite groups is the product of the orders of the groups producted. Producted? Is that a word? I don't know. Well, I just used it, so it must be. 
Um, anyway, so by definition, that's phi r s, that's phi r, that's phi s, and there's the theorem. Hey, let's let's apply this theorem. Some examples, yeah. So, uh, example seven. Um, phi twenty four is phi three times phi eight. We've previously explained that phi of 3 is 2 and phi of 8 is 4, so 2 times 4 is 8, hooray. Um, phi of 20, well, 4 times 5, is, those are relatively prime, so I can do phi of 4 times phi of 5, but phi of 4 was 2 and phi of 5 was 4. If you forgot where that came from, that was examples 3, 4, and 10 of lecture 15, lecture 14. Um, example 9, phi of 72 is 8 times 9, those are co-prime, so I can apply the theorem and get 4 times 6 which is 24. Again, this is coming from example 7, 8, and 11 of lecture 14. And then here's a, here's a little bit, a little bit harder of an example. Um, here we have phi of 3,000. All right, phi of 3,000 is phi of 3 times 10 to the third. These are co-prime, right? Because 1,000 and 3 don't have any common factor. Um, so that's phi of 3 times phi of 10 to the third, but what is 10 to the, but then you see I can do it again, right? So phi of 2 to the 3rd, 5 to the 3rd, because 10 is, 10 is 2 times 5, right? So that's 2 to the 3rd, 5 to the 3rd. Those are co-prime. So I can apply the theorem. You get phi of 3 times phi of 2 to the 3rd times phi of 5 to the 3rd. But remember last lecture we proved that phi of p to the k is p to the k minus p to the k minus 1. So we get 2 from the phi of 3, 8 minus 4 from that, and 125 minus 5, 25 from that which gives us a grand total of 2 times 4 times 100, which is 800. So, wow, there are 800 numbers relatively prime to 3,000. And, um, of course, I'm talking about the numbers which are smaller than 3,000, right? There are infinitely many numbers co-prime to 3,000 if you allow numbers larger than 3,000, right? <laughs> Here's a question, though. Um, so, so what? We've proved that the order of the group of units, mod 3000, is 800. Is it cyclic? Is there one number that will generate all of these 800 numbers? Is there an element of order 800 in this group? I don't know. Um, well, that's what we're going to spend the next few pages kind of trying to gain tools to unwrap that question, okay? But this much we can say on the basis of these theorems is that for distinct primes, um, for distinct for distinct primes p1 through p cap p s, if you have these prime powers, since these are coprime, we can repeatedly apply the theorem at the top of this page, and get phi of this is you know phi of p k1, phi of p k2, phi of p. Oh man, I already scanned this. I'm sorry guys, you're gonna have to add these. Um, I guess I'll have to rescan this when I go back in Friday, but it, it, there's a, I, those need numbers, right? So this is phi of P1 to the K1, right? This is phi of P2 to the K2. Oh, lest I forget. Oh no! I have my, my sad, my Lego car, it broke. I guess that means the secret word is broken. There we go. Um, secret word is broken. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting you the secret word. I, I'll get with it eventually, guys. Um, all right, so moving on. If, uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit more about product groups. What do we know about them? How can we understand them? How can we take them apart, so to speak? Um, given a product group, an element of the product group, the order of that element is the least common multiple of the orders of the uh, components. All right, so like here's an example. If I have 3, 2 in U5 cross U7, what's the order of 3? Well, mod 5, we calculate that the order of 3 is 4 because, uh oh, um, because if we look at powers of 3, we eventually get to 3 to the 4, which is 1 for the so the smallest positive integer, which goes back to 1 in the power of 3, is, is 1. So the order of 3 is 4 in U5. In contrast, with 2, when we get to 2 cubed, we get to 8, which is 1 mod 7. So the order of 2 is 3. 
What does all this mean? This means that the order of the pair, 3, 2, least common multiple of 3 and 4, or 4 and 3 rather, which is 12. So the order of 3, 2 in this product group um, is 12. In other words, if you were to take 3, 2 and raise it to powers, so you do like 3, 2, let's say to the j power, which would be, by the way, 3 to the j, 2 to the j, that's how that works. This would be equal to 1, 1, um, for j equal to 12, and it would not be equal to 1, 1 for any j less than that, okay? That's the first power which sends it to the identity, so the order of that element is, is 1. Um, okay, so moving on here, a cyclic group of order, let me scoot this up a bit here, a cyclic group of order n has phi n generators. And if d divides n, there exists a subgroup of order d, and that subgroup is cyclic with phi of d generators. Moreover, if we add up Euler phi function of all the divisors of n, we get back to n. So these are some additional things we know from group theory that relate the Euler phi function and cyclic groups, which are, which are nice to know. The proof of all of these things takes me a couple of hours to do properly, okay? So I'm just reminding you some results. Let me see how they play out, though. Well, here's a corollary. If a group of n has more than phi of d elements of order d, where d is a divisor of the order of the group, then that group is not cyclic. So here's, here's, here's um, a couple different things in that theorem playing out. So example 12, I have z30. What are the divisors of 30? 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. And if you add the Euler phi functions respectively of 1, 2, 3, 4, excuse me, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30, you get 1, 1, 2, 4, 2, 4, 8, and 8. And if you add those numbers up, 30. So, hooray, there's an example of that. Okay, that's sometimes useful to know. Um, and then the other thing is the example 13 we can see that U8 is not cyclic since U8 is 1, 3, 5, and 7. And if you look, we've got 1, 2, 3 elements of order 2, but the thing is phi of 2 is 1. So you can only have at most one element of order 2 in a cyclic group. If you've got a group and you have more than one element of order 2, it's not cyclic. Simple as that. Okay, so there's some clues as to how we can decide that question on the first that I posed a few pages ago, you know. Is the, you know, group of units mod 3000, is it cyclic, right? Well, if we could find more than one element of order 2 in there, game over, not cyclic, right? Um, so here's the, the big theorem. Um, U of P is isomorphic to Z... Uh, mod p minus 1 for p prime, okay? And um, if p equals to 2, we have a couple of different things. Well, u of 2 is isomorphic to the trivial group, or I'll just write it as 0. But u of 2 to the power n is isomorphic to z2 cross z to the 2 to the n minus 2 for n larger than or equal to 2. On the other hand, if p is an odd prime, then u of p to the n is just, this, it's cyclic, and it's order p to the n minus p to the n minus 1. So it's interesting, both of these groups, they, they're different structure, right? This one's cyclic, this one's not. Um, but they have the same order, um, in, the same, in the sense that, like, the order of u to the 2n is the order of that, which is, by the way, 2 times that which is 2 to the n minus 1, and if you work it out, this is equal to that. So it's the prime to the n minus the prime to the n minus 1, and the same story down here. So, you know, for an odd prime, it's the order of that, which is, again, order p to the n minus p to the n minus 1. So the counting's the same for even and odd, even though the structure of the group is different, like cyclic, not cyclic, yeah? So, just to be a little bit more explicit here, um, 
u16 is u to u of 2 to the 4th, so that's z2 cross z4. All right, remember, v of 16 has 8 things, as it turns out, because 2 times 4 is 8. Um, u to the, f the group of units of order 80, the structure of that group, up isomorphism is u5 cross u16, but using the theorem at the top of this page, that's uz4 cross z2 cross z4. All right, and you can count how many things there are by multiplying these. 2 times 4, 4 times 2 times 4 is um, 32. There are 32 relatively prime numbers to 80. And u80 is not a cyclic group. u16 um, was also not cyclic. Um, so, I mean, I'm not proving to you they're not cyclic, but I'm saying you could find more than one element of order 2, I think, in all of these, yeah. Um, just as that's a just a go-to, easy to prove thing. Yeah, there are other ways of showing it's not cyclic. But um, u forty-two is well six times seven, so that's u six cross u seven, which then using six is two times three is u two cross u three cross u seven. Right? Uh, u two is the zero group. U three is z two, and u seven is z six up to isomorphism. When you have zero crossed with other things, you can just throw it away. It's like it's not there. And that is just z2 cross z6 up to isomorphism, which means that phi of 42 is equal to 12. And also, it's not cyclic. All right. So, in fact, to be clear, all of the groups above are not cyclic. This means there does not exist an element of the order of the group. In each case, there is no x in u16 with order 8. There's no y in u80 with order 32. And there's no z in u42 with order 12. All right, that's another way to look at it to prove the non-existence of a of a group of uh, of an order of an element of order of the group. Although I think it's much easier to say just give a give example of, hey, these two elements have order two, so it's not cyclic, right? Because if a group has two elements of order two, it's not a cyclic group. That's a much more concrete, easy thing to prove. So if I ask you a homework question, you know explain whether or not this group is cyclic, like, I think the easy way to answer the homework question would just be to find two elements of order two and go, hey, not cyclic, come on. Um, anyway, so group exponent, what's the group exponent? It's the smallest positive integer e for which x to the e is equal to one for all x in the group. All right, so, of course, if the group of is order n, then we know that x to the n is equal to one, right? If one is the um, multiplicative identity, so that means that the group exponent has to be less than or equal to the order of the group. So in fact, the group exponent must divide the order of the group. If g is cyclic with order of g equals to n, then the group exponent is just n. But if g is not cyclic, then it's more exciting. All right. Um, and remember, the order of elements is preserved under isomorphism, so we may use the isomorphisms to help answer questions about what is the group exponent. So here's a kind of little bit involved um, example here. So we have u35, which is u5 cross u7, which is z4 cross z6. Then my question is, what's the element of maximum order in z4 cross z6? Well, if I've got x comma y, then the order is the least common multiple of the order of x and the order of y. So you can start thinking about what are possible orders you could get, right? And, um, you know, I, I'm thinking through a process here, but the ultimate answer for all of these just works out to the least common multiple of 4 and 6. So Jones and Jones is pretty clear about this. You just look at, you just take 4 and 6, find the least common multiple. So what's the least common multiple of 4 and 6? It is 12, all right? So that means that every element, um, every element in Z4 cross Z6, when you raise it to the 12th, when you, you know, add it to itself 12 times here, because it's an additive group, you get back to zero. So 12 times xy is 12x times 12y. So that's um, 3 times 4x, and this is 2 times 6, 6y. So that's why they're both zero, mod 4 and mod 6. So the group exponent here is 12. And what that means is that there is a... Um, so... 
like, okay, so let's, let's, what is that element in U35? That takes a little bit more work to actually figure out what is the element of order 12. This tells us that it exists. How do you actually find it? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, what, what, what I did, though, was I was like, okay, well, 2, 3 is an element of order 12 in um, U5 cross U7. How do I get that? Since the order of 2 is 4 in U5 and the order of 3 is 6 in U7. Um, all right. So that's just explicit calculation. You can check it. The order of 2 is 4 in U5. The order of 3 is 6 in U7. I haven't shown the details here. I used a calculator to figure that out, guys. Um, so then if we look at x congruent to 2 mod 5 and x congruent to 3 mod 7, you use the Chinese remainder theorem on that, right? And out pops x congruent to 13 mod 35. And that number, 17, has order 12 in U35. So you can actually use the um, the isomorphism that we had looked at earlier in the thing, earlier in this lecture, to work back to find the element of the order that has like the maximum order. Anyway, so example. But another example here is this. So here we have come on paper U33. Which of course is isomorphic to U3 cross U11, which is isomorphic to Z2 cross Z10. And then what's the order of Z2 cross Z10? Well, I, I talked through some details here, but long story short, it's the least common multiple of 2 and 10, which is 10. So the group exponent of U33 is 10. Um, what is that? What is an element of order 10 in U33? Well, I, I figured it out by tracking backwards from x equals to 2 and x equals to 3. x equals to 2 um, mod 3 has order 2 and y equals to 3 mod 11 has order 5. So least common multiple of 2 and 5 is 10. So if I look at 2, 3, that's 2 comma 3 is an element of order 10 in here, but then use the Chinese remainder theorem to go back to the this guy, right? And that gives me 14 mod 33, that's my element that has order 10 and u33. Alright. Now, now I'm not saying that u33 is cyclic, that everything is generated by it. Far from it. The point is that 14 is the element of largest order in u33, um, but you can't find an element of order. So what's the order of 33? u33. The order of u33 is 20, and yet the order of largest the element of largest order is 10. So you can't find one element that gets you all of U33. It's not cyclic. But this is this is nevertheless a useful identity, as we shall see when we study RSA encryption. A um, few more examples. To solve x to the fourth congruent to 18 mod 11, what we can do is we look at it, we go, okay, so mod 11, this x has to be a unit, right? Because 8 is can, is relatively prime to 11, 18 is relatively prime to 11. So if this is a unit and x to the fourth is equal to a unit, is then that means x to the fourth must also be a unit, um, if, if, such a, if such an x existed, right? And um, so that means x to the fourth is equal to 18, which is, by the way, 7 in u11. But notice that U11 is cyclic, right? It's in fact order 10. And if you look at powers of 2, I have listed their modulus, I mean the remainders here, mod, mod 11, you can see that, well, among other things, you can see that 2 gets two, 2 is a generator. 2 is a generator for U11. So U11 is cyclic, in fact. One of its generators is 2. And um, we can also see that, if you look at it, that 2 to the 7th is 7. So um, so we don't know what x is, but since, since it's a cyclic group, we know it's 2 to some power. So that's the substitution I was talking about at the start of the lecture, x equals 2 to the j. And so plugging that in, we get 2 to the j to the 4th is equal to 2 to the 7th, because 18 is, is equal to 2 to the 7th mod um, 11. But that gives us 2 to the 
4j is equal to 2 to the 7. In order for these to be equal, you would have to have 4j is congruent to 7 mod 10, because this is a group of order 10, and when you have um, an equation like this, you only get it mod, the exponents have to match up, mod the order of the group, which in this case is 10. But is there any solution to that? Um, I don't think there is, right? Because the GCD of 4 and 10 is 2, and 2 does not divide 7, no solution. So this example 18, no solution. In contrast, example 9, same modulus, but different 3 over here, all right? So same idea as example 18, but now 3 is equal to 2 to the 8th mod 11. So that gets us to solve 2 to the j to the 4 equals 2 to the 8 mod 11, which is 4, which gives us 4j congruent to 8 mod 10. And since the GCD of 4 and 10 is 2, and 2 divides 8, we know that we're going to find two solutions. It's easy enough to see j equals 2 is my initial guess, right? You can see 2 times 4 is 8 mod 10, of course. But then the other one, remember, we take the initial guess and we do... Um, the modulus, which in this case is 10, and divide by 2, and that gives us 5, so 2 plus 5 is 7, and of course that's not surprising, right, because, um, let's see here, so 2 to the x equals 2 squared, which is 4, x equals 2 to the 7th, which is 7, um, mod 11, these both solve x to the 4th equals to 3 and, Z and u11. In other words, x congruent to 4 and 7 mod 11 are the solutions to our um, nonlinear congruence mod 11. So th this is a, this is a, you know, pretty formidable technique. The idea is if it's cyclic, we can write the x we're looking for in terms of the generator, right? If everything in the un is a power of the generator, then we can replace the variable thing by a variable power of the generator, in this case the 2 to the j in example 18 and example 19, and then we can do, we can, we can simplify the, um, the exponent mod the Euler phi function of n, which is comparatively easier than trying to think through a quartic congruence, yeah, since we don't really have any method to work through a quartic congruence except to just check all the classes, I suppose that's always an option, but and um, anyway, I should mention page 110 to 113 in Jones and Jones um, shows how to extend examples 19 and 18 and 19 to more complicated moduli um, if you're interested in going further. But um, probably your homework will just be on this. I won't likely won't test on the, the more sophisticated. There's a couple more sophisticated directions that Jones and Jones goes to try to deal with when the group of units is like a Cartesian product of groups of units or when it involves, um, there's a trick using five to a power for like the even groups, but anyway, too far into the weeds for us. I think this more than suffices for, for this class. So thanks guys and enjoy.